Hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. So in a previous video I explained how the presence of noise in a fiber optical telecommunication system can reduce the signal to noise ratio which in turn limits the amount of data we can send from point A to point B per second. In that video I mainly focused on the impact of linear noise introduced by amplifiers but I didn't explain the other major source of noise which is nonlinear noise. So let's take a look at that today. Essentially, what we're trying to do is send data from a city over here to a city over here. And the amount of data we can send is going to be determined by the signal to noise ratio at this location. That's going to depend on two factors. There's both the linear noise, which is introduced by all the amplifiers in the span. And that's quite easy to sort of calculate in advance because we know how amplifiers work. They're sort of very well behaved, very easy to model systems. However, the other contribution is the nonlinear noise. And that's a bit more tricky because apart from depending on the characteristics of the fibers, it also depends on the characteristic of the signal we're sending, how much power does it have, how all the channels are ranged in the frequency span and so on. Now, why do we want to calculate this in the first place? Well, as you can imagine, deploying a fiber optical link is quite expensive. So before we do that, it's nice to have a, a correct, accurate picture of what the signal to notification will be over here before we spend all that money on actually uh, putting in the, the fiber cable. So if we can calculate the nonlinear noise in advance, we can sort of make a good estimate of the, um, let's say the viability of that link before we, we go through the effort of actually deploying it. So to actually calculate this, we're going to need a numerical simulation. So I've imported my usual split step functions that you may have seen in previous videos and set up a time base right here. Then I've also set up a signal that we can take a look at. So this signal essentially consists of a large number of small channels that are ranging from the uh, low edge of the C-band to the upper edge here marked in red. Now, every single one of these channels has a width of 120 gigahertz, then has an actual 20 gigahertz signal inside of it. If we zoom in, we can see that in a bit more detail. Um, basically, this range here from the two vertical orange lines, that's the, uh, the whole channel, that's 120 gigahertz right here. Then the actual signal has a width of 20 gigahertz in here. So what we want to compute is the signal to noise ratio at the end of this span. And one way we can, um, we can think about this is as the area of the actual signal power within that 20 um, gigahertz range divided by the total uh, power that's outside of that range, but still inside of the the channel. So basically the, these two areas divided by each other, that's going to give us the signal to noise ratio. Now the fiber span we're going to be looking at today is set up in kind of a slightly contrived way, you could say, because it consists of a 10 kilometer of fiber in the beginning with a very high number of steps. And the reason is that in the very beginning of the span, all of these different channels will be overlapping in the time domain, giving a very high peak power and therefore lots of nonlinearity, both self-phase modulation, cross-phase modulation, and also four-wave mixing. So in other words, we have a very small step size in the very beginning to capture that accurately. But then as we propagate forward, first of all, the power is going to decrease because of attenuation, but these signals are also going to spread out in the time domain due to dispersion. So we can take slightly larger steps at that point. At the end of the span, I've placed an amplifier uh, to exactly compensate for the span loss present in this fiber right here. So in other words, we have 40 kilometers worth of fiber, that's a certain amount of loss. And this um, amplifier exactly compensates for that. So if you have 10 decibels of loss throughout the span, this one just multiplies the whole um, the whole spectrum by a factor of, of 10 to recover that power. And then we just do the same thing for all the other, all the spans right here. One small thing to note here is that um, specifically these amplifiers here do not add any linear noise. We're only focusing on the nonlinear contributions. So we're just going to assume that they work perfectly ideally and don't add any, um, any noise contribution at all. They just scale up the, the power. Okay, so I've um, essentially propagated that signal through these uh, fibers. And we can take a look at the result right here. So here we see that the signal in general spreads out in the time domain, which makes sense because there's multiple frequencies and also dispersion. And uh, we can see that as soon as we hit the end of a fiber span, we get another boost to the power. That's why we sort of get these uh, almost lines in the pulse evolution. You see, as soon as we reach another amplifier, the power gets boosted up, which translates to a change in the color inside of this plot. Furthermore, if you look at the actual uh, initial and final spectrum at the end of the fiber span, we see that initially, we just have the blue signal here, and most of the power is contained within that 20 gigahertz range. But at the end of the fiber span, we can see that some of the power has sort of leaked out into the, the side frequencies, and that's going to essentially be interpreted as noise when we do the, the detection. Okay, so let's actually see what the evolution of this uh, signal to noise ratio looks like. You can see here that I've chosen three channels, one that's at a low frequency, a middle frequency, and a high frequency. And you'll notice that basically in every single case, we get a very steep decrease in the SNR at the very beginning, because that's where most of the nonlinearity is present. We have both forward mixing, cross-phase modulation, and self-phase modulation at that point. So we get a very quick decrease in the power. But as soon as the signal starts to disperse and also attenuate a bit, that gets uh, sort of flattened out a little bit. So here we see a zoom into that uh, the sort of range here where it seems to settle down. 
what you can notice is that at the end of every fiber span when we encounter an amplifier, the power gets boosted back up. And because we have more power, then, then uh, we also get a steeper decrease in the SNR value, because now we have more nonlinearity. So you can see it sort of decreases and then flattens out a bit because the power gets decreased. Then the power is boosted back up, and so we get a steeper decrease again. And we reach a final value around like 19, 22 or something like that. Depends a bit on the channel. And of course, we can also plot this um, nonlinear signal to noise ratio for every single channel in this, this range. So um, this um, model of the nonlinear noise I presented here has some simplifications inside of it, of course. Um, I'm not taking polarization into account, for example. And a general problem that, even if I did take that into account, is that this splits the method is quite computationally expensive to, to run. And this is not so much of a problem if you're only modeling like a single single link. But you can imagine that if you want to model, let's say, a whole network inside of a, a whole country with many different links between different cities, this becomes very um, computationally slow to, to run for all of those links. But luckily, there actually is a way, under some certain um, simplifying assumptions, to compute all this analytically, or at least maybe with a single numerical integral you have to calculate. But that's still a lot better than doing a very large number of Fourier transforms. And essentially that model is called the Gaussian noise model. And I've linked the paper both in the notebook but also in the description that sort of goes through the detail of how to um, derive sort of a general version of this this model. It's it's quite long, but I think it's uh, actually manageable to understand what's, uh, what's going on. So you can take a look at that if you want. So that brings us to the end of this video. Feel free to check out some of my other videos and check the description for more details. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.